George and his wife Jane live in the Skypad apartments in Orbit City with their two kids, Judy and Elroy, their dog Astro and a robot maid named Rosie. George's work week consists of an hour a day, two days a week, and he commutes in an aero car with a transparent bubble top. Now, I'm old enough to remember the Jetsons cartoon show, although I wasn't yet born when it was created back in 1962. And here we are 60 years later, perhaps on the cusp of the imaginary Jetsons future becoming a reality. Driverless cars and drone deliveries suggest the possibility of a world where, like George, we can jump in an air taxi and cross the city in a fraction of the time it takes to battle congested roads. If this becomes a reality, what would this mean for our airways, views, noise, privacy, safety, and what will it do to property values? Welcome to The Elephant in the Room. This is the podcast where we love to talk about the big things in property that never usually get talked about. I'm Veronica Morgan, real estate agent, buyer's agent, co-host of Foxtel's Location, Location, Location Australia and author of Auction Ready. And I'm Chris Bates, mortgage broker. Before we get started, I need to let you know that nothing we say on here can be taken as personal advice. We always recommend you engage the services of a professional. Don't forget that you can access the transcript for this episode on the website as well as download our free full or forecast report which experts can you trust to get it right? Theelephantintheroom.com.au Our guest today is Clem Newton-Brown, CEO and founder of Skyports, the only Australian business developing a network of landing sites for future air taxi network. Clem is a very rare person to have a frame from the Jetsons uh, cartoon on his wall. (laughs) Uh, So he's obviously subscribing to this this wild future. Clem's background as a former Deputy Lord Mayor of Melbourne, member of Victorian Parliament and barrister specialising in planning and property development has put him at the forefront of this emerging industry. Clem serves on several federal, state, industry and international committees, advancing the development of the rules and regulations around establishing a whole new era of clean, green electric aviation. And assuming the requisite changes come through, the success of this emerging industry will depend on the infrastructure that is a network of sites from which air taxis will pick up and drop off their passengers. Skyports already has over 400 property partner sites in Australia and New Zealand, which are ready to activate when these regulations permit. And we're really keen to have a glimpse into the future, which may be here sooner rather than later by the sounds of it. Thank you so much for joining us, Clem. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Clem, so th- thanks so much for coming. I've um, been wanting to do this episode for a while, to be honest. it was I was reading about Uber Air a few years ago and, you know, tracking drones and cars that can fly, et cetera. And, you know, a bit of a fascination around it. And I thought, you know, if, if this was m- becomes mainstream, it completely revolutionises what's possible, you know, with where you live and where you work, et cetera. So, so good to have you on. I mean, just on there on the Uber story, we talked very briefly off, on offline about it. I mean, you know, how realistic is this sort of, uh, I guess, revolution um, actually going to be mainstream within our lifetime or within our working lifetime, you know, in the next 10 to, to 30 years, let's say? Sure. Look, in the course of our discussion, I hope by the end of it, everybody will realize, you know, that, that this is uh, it is upon us. It's not a fantasy. It's, it's happening. Um, uh, you know, I'll talk about, uh, you know, drone deliveries that have been happening in Australia for some time now. There's uh, electric uh, air taxis already in the air, um, 300 in development. Um, so th- we'll get into all that in a moment. But just to, to go back to the start where um, well, Uber Air is probably where it started with me and Uber was uh, Uber sort of got kickstarted this they drew together all the the players who were in this industry built like working on aircraft thinking about a new form of um, I used to call it urban air mobility now it's AAM advanced air mobility and the, the reasons for that I'll tell you in a moment but um, the uh, uh, so Uber to their credits put out a white paper in about 2015 uh, with this vision of uh, Jetson style um, uh, form of mobility. And, uh, you know, Uber being the, the mega marketing machine, um, you know, did a great job at promoting that. Um, they started off with Dallas and LA, and then they started a worldwide search for a third test city. And um, uh, they chose little old Melbourne. So it was, uh, they were looking at you know, all around the world, um, uh, different cities, and they came to Melbourne. And at that time, I was working as a planning consultant for um, the microflight helicopters that owns the helipad on the Yarra River in Melbourne. Oh, yeah. You own the helipad in the central city location in, in Australia. And um, we were trying to get some longevity for their operations there. And um, government was 
not being very easy to to talk to. And um, and then we hear Uber Air comes to town and the the red carpet gets rolled out. So they've got back to back meetings <laughs> with ministers. And after this, you know, they're talking about flying saucers. And here, my clients are real business with you know forty <laughs> staff and twenty five aircraft, you know, twenty five thousand people a year flying out of that site, and we couldn't get a meeting. So. Um, so Skyports was really set up as a bit of a Trojan horse to get a seat at the table. Um, so I set it up really just to say, I said to my client, look, you know, I'm happy to set this up. And uh, if Uber Air really are coming to Melbourne, they're going to want, want to use this pad. And, um, you know, let's let's sort of be part of this and, and get a seat you know, in, in these negotiations. And um, so it works. You know, we ended up being you know, supporting the Victorian government's bid for um, Uber to choose Melbourne. Um, we were invited over to Washington for the announcement. It was all very exciting. They had this... Um, very slick sort of uh, auditorium uh, two-day conference with thousands of people and, um, you know, lots of uh, slick presentations and head mics and music and everything else. And it was a bit like a, one of those uh, religious conventions. Right? <laughs> but uh, all the clever people were actually in the audience uh, and the, the, the salespeople were on stage. And, um, uh, and look, you know, t- to their credit, as I said, Uber did and there were some very clever people who were in Uber who that they got in to, to kickstart this. And, um, uh, you know, to their credit, they did kickstart things, but there was no follow through. And I think they would probably even concede that, uh, you know, that there wasn't a lot of, um, uh, certainly with Melbourne, there was very, very little action done. There was one person who was employed in um, Sydney, bizarrely, for uh, a short time, and, um, and that was it. So, um, yeah. So what I thought, yeah, with Skyport, so I came back from Washington and thought, gee, I've landed on my feet. I've started this uh, this business that um, isn't really a business, but you know, it's Uber's about to sort of come to Melbourne and uh, and uh, you know, it's going to be massive. And a lot there was a lot of excitement in the property industry at that time, and um, uh, you know, people would be trying to property owners would be trying to f- phone Uber, and there's no sort of one eight hundred Uber number as you probably discovered when you were trying to track them down. And it's uh, you know very hard to actually find a, a real person to talk to, and um, and the reality is you know, they don't want to. They, they weren't interested in talking to individual property owners. Though you know they put out the press release, they were getting the media, they were raising money, um, and um, I don't think they had any real commitment to actually doing anything tangible. Um, so, and in any case, look from a property perspective, you know. Uh, it's not if you've got a good site for a vertiport, um, you know nobody's going to want just one. They want a network, and um, it's a bit like if you've got a, uh, you know, if you're trying to sell uh, sell something, you don't go to uh, on, on a billboard. You know, you don't go to a building owner and say, "Can I put my my uh, you know my sign on your building?" You go to an agency that's got thousands of sites and they roll out across the country. So, and I think that's how this will pan out, and that's the sort of um, you know the benefit I think um, Skyports is putting together. Pulling together all the interested parties into into one group, and at the moment, you know, none of the sites can be activated yet, or or few of them can. Um, but you know, the benefit is that you know when the big investment comes, that we've sort of done that work to to bring the um, bring the sites together. So so that was sort of the genesis of it with uh, with Uber. So Uber's now been subsumed into um, the front runner, which is Joby Aviation, which is based in the states, and there they've got a. You can go onto YouTube and you can their aircraft are flying. Um, you know, there's um, there's several that are sort of you know, uh, um, you know, flying with people in them and um, doing getting to the doing the testing to enable them to get through to commercial certification. It's a pretty big step from going from a, um, a you know a mega drone that will fly with you know a big payload uh, to building such a drone that can be um, commercially certified to take passengers safely. So um, yeah. you know, this industry has to be as safe or safer than existing airlines. You, know, you don't think when you go on a plane to London, this plane might crash. Uh, well, most of you don't, I suppose. But um, you know, there's, <laughs> there's a good chance, very good chance that it won't crash. And, and look, you know, and that's because of the, you know, the safety that's built, been built over the years. And, and all the air regulators around the world are working towards, you know, a, uh, you know only uh, pr- approving aircraft when, they, when they've, they've got these new set of standards that are, uh, are very safe. What are, what are the reasons, I guess, that you're fairly confident your um, jumbo jet, it's not a jumbo jet anymore, anyway, your big plane flying to London is not going to crash is because there's not the air is not congested with lots of little planes all whizzing around. So that's always fascinated me, not not just the safety in the air but the safety on the ground. When you've got lots and lots, even just drones, let alone lots and lots of these small craft all whizzing around in three-dimensional space, I mean, you can't stop accidents on the road yeah. right all of a sudden and and often it's said you've got more chance of dying in a car accident than you do in a plane 
But if yeah. you suddenly start taking all that sort of com commuter activity from the ground up into the sky, I mean, that just yeah. it blows my mind. But I'm not an expert in this space, of course. So I'm, I'm fascinated about the planning and the changes to engineering and uh, aircraft um, traffic control, that sort of stuff that needs to be taken into account. Yeah. Yeah, look, from a um... – I mean, you're quite right. Look, you know, autonomous vehicles, um, uh, you know, it's very difficult to, to retrofit a city for an autonomous vehicle to safely operate, as we've seen there. Mm. You know, there, there have been accidents with, with autonomous vehicles. Um, but, you know, on the ground, you've got all sorts of things to, to contend with. You know, you've got you know, signs that have to be read. You've got kids and dogs and bikes and trees and signs and, and potholes, mm. all sorts of things. So, yeah. Uh, Arguably, it's going to be easier when you're in the sky to um, to achieve autonomy. Look, most of the aircraft are, are starting with pilots, so they will be, um, uh, you know, essentially electric helicopters. There's nothing actually that amazing about it. It's just a different form of propulsion with a pilot. But most of them are also being designed such that they they will move to autonomy. There's one one uh, aircraft called the Whisk, which is backed by Google, and they're going straight to autonomy. So they'll never have a pilot in. And if you look in terms of this, you know, is that feasible? I mean, I bought a DJI drone from you know, JB Hi-Fi and was taking pictures of you know, kids jumping off a cliff at the beach uh, last summer, a very windy day. Looking back at the footage, it looked like the, the air, aircraft was sitting on a tripod. It was just so solid in this gusty wind. <laughs> and you, know, you, try to, you try to crash the, those drones, even a $2,000 drone, it's very hard to actually crash because they've got sensors mm. that um, prevent, it, prevent, prevent them running into things. If the battery runs low, it turns around and comes home uh, or it lands. So it's, you know, this technology is already there. Obviously, it's, it's going to have to be you know, way more complex in a, in a passenger situation. But, but that's the sort of technology which everybody's anticipating will make it safer than, uh, than other forms of aviation. Because yeah. uh, a, a lot of particularly small aircraft, it's the, it's the pilot error that causes planes to crash mm. with, with small aircraft. Um, and also with helicopters, it's a single point of failure. If you um, if you've got the uh, the one bolt that holds the um, the propellers on uh, 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 failing, then you, you you drop like a balloon. So uh, drop like a, a stone. Sorry, <laughs> not like a balloon. Yeah. Um, so uh, you know, my, all the all the aircraft have been developed of having multiple rotors, multiple motors, uh, so that you know, there's redundancies there if if there's failures. So I think everybody knows that this air, these aircraft are going to have to be super super safe, and it will, may take some time for the community to be satisfied with that and that's why i think there'll be a, a, a transitional period where there'll be heavy lifting drones that that do um move goods and that those aircraft will then morph into being passenger passenger carrying once they've proven themselves to be uh, safe and the community wants them so what's your best case claim i mean um just reading a bit about autonomous cars and you know i'm not an expert at it at all but i've you know the conversation the years sort of tick over right and you know, everyone thought maybe by 2030 that we're all going to be you know, sitting back and, you know, watching TV as we commute around. But I feel like that's sort of pushed out a little bit, you know, some issues with, you know, cars catching fire and all sorts of issues. I mean, do you do you think that this is going to, our best case scenario, we're talking like 15, 20 years till we're actually getting passengers? Or do you, you know, is that like, I don't know, worst case? Like, what, What's your sort of uh, timeline in your head to, yeah. to where realistically, you know, the everyday Australian can use these rather than, you know, the people can afford to hire helicopters now. Yeah, look, and, and I think they will, we'll get into uh, the, the issue of the costs will maybe ask me a different question, but um, uh, on the issue of the, the timing, look, there's over 300 aircraft in development. So it's a bit like Wright Brothers days. There's all sorts of contraptions being built and most yes. of them won't get there because it, it's, it takes probably a billion dollars to get to the point of an air, a new aircraft being designed and certified commercially. So there'll probably be half a dozen that get there and there'll probably be, you know, uh, you know, two or three that get through probably in the next two years. Um, right. So, you know, the front runners are, you know, as I said, they're already flying. There's one called the, um, uh, the Alia, which is made by a company called Beta Technologies in the States. They've already flown 1,400 miles across the States, fully electric. Um, and, uh, you know, with a pilot, I actually met the test pilot. He came to our, our conference here in Melbourne uh, earlier this year. And um, uh, so, so, you know, they haven't got the transition yet from the vertical liftoff to the horizontal um, uh, movement. So they, they took off like a conventional plane because they uh, unusually they've got wheels as well. Uh, but just so I think there's you know, $10 billion went into the front runners last year. So, you know, there's, there's half a dozen. They're really well funded. They're, they're already flying. And you're backed by companies like, you know, Boeing, Bell and Brea, Airbus, 
Uh, so all the aviation companies that build the existing aircraft, so they know what they're doing. Um, and you know, airlines in the States have already put in orders. So you know, American Airlines, uh, uh, Delta, um, uh, you know, they, they, they put in orders for these aircraft. So I, I think they're, they're coming, but that doesn't mean we're going to see the skies you know, black with air taxis um, anytime soon. It's going to be a, a slow progression and they will start off with pilots. So essentially what we'll see is that there'll be test cities where they start operating and they will use existing infrastructure. So essentially it'll be, you know, the helicopter that might have taken off from that helipad is now going to be an electric helicopter uh, and it'll do the same route. And, but it'll do it quieter and cheaper um, and, and and more safely. And so, you know, it's just replacing one form of propulsion with another, I don't think is a huge step. Um, so I, I don't think you should be looking at this. This will be 20 years down the track. This will, this will happen very soon. The autonomous side of things is going to be what takes a lot longer. And that's something mm. which uh, there's a whole lot of companies working on on air traffic management and um, look, you know, CASA and air services in Australia, they're, they're gearing up for this. So, you know, they've released a, a, a paper, a policy roadmap about w- what they're going to be doing to it, to enable um, autonomous flight. And they're already enabling it with, with drone deliveries. So drone deliveries, uh, Google started doing them in Canberra about two or three years ago. Now this expanded to, um, uh, to Brisbane, and they're, I understand, going to be expanding, you know, a whole lot, whole lot wider. And they're, they're just small sort of one kilo deliveries. Um, there's another Melbourne company called Swoop that's been operating overseas for years doing drone deliveries in um, uh, in, in Africa mainly, and they're they're they're, they're doing trials and testing all over the place. And I understand that they they're, they're uh, looking at setting up a, a service in um, uh, in Melbourne soon as well. So I think I think you know we're we're already seeing pilotless aircraft in the sky, <laughs> um, and. Uh, just be, and they will just get progressively bigger and carry more payload to get to the point where we're carrying so much payload we could actually repl- replace the payload with people and we're satisfied that it's safe enough to do so. And I think that that you know, without people, and I think you you are talking ten plus years before you would be flying around without with um, with uh, without a pilot in them. Um, but the technology will be there. You know, it's already yeah. there. Yeah, but do you think that soon is really rather than one? person jumping on one drone you know it's not that efficient right but if you can go to a local sort of port and then you know 15 or 20 people jump onto a drone and they get to the city do you think that that's when it really revolutionizes the i guess commuter travel because you start to really replace cars with with you know drones yeah look there's a number of factors that people are predicting will make this much more affordable than helicopters and ride sharing is is one of them um, and look, you know, when Uber started their um, their uh, you know, option of being able to share a ride with a stranger uh, for a bit, a bit less, you know, that's that's you know that's the sort of thing where you know people are, uh, are getting into the mindset you don't have to actually be in the aircraft or the car on your own; you're sharing it with others. Um, so that that reduces the cost. The um, the uh, the fuel is significantly cheaper to charge batteries than it is to um, to buy jet fuel. Um, like really significantly cheaper, like that aircraft that flew across the states. Um, a similar one leg in a in a light aircraft was about seven hundred dollars in fuel, and the electric aircraft was seventeen dollars in electricity to charge wow. the battery. So really game changing cost and uh, changes. And the, and the other thing that, which is going to be um, uh, uh, you know make it make it um, more uh, you know, attractive is having multiple destinations to, to go to. So yeah. you're getting closer to the spots where you want to go to. So all these things will sort of come together, but it'll all take time. And look, you know, my, my business, Skyports, you know, we're working on the basis that this is, um, this is happening. The aircraft, and I have no doubt the aircraft will be you know, operating somewhere, probably not Australia, but somewhere within the next couple of years, probably Miami or Los Angeles seems to be the, uh, the, um, where, they're, where they're focusing. And, you know, and the fact that the model depends on them being able to do more than helicopters can do. So if all they can do is fly from a helipad to an airport, we haven't actually created anything new. It's, it's great. You know, they're, they're less polluting, they're quieter and, and hopefully cheaper yeah. and safer. Um, but to actually be revolutionary, we need to have the, the, the density of landing sites. And that's, and that's the basis that I'm working on is that with, with, uh, if we can get – the multiple sites destination get the, the networks happening um, and that's when they can really fulfill their potential. What sort of range are we talking about? I mean obviously mm. in an urban area um, or across the city you're going to be wanting lots of lots of spots to pick up and drop off right um, lots of landing spots but you know are you envisaging uh, I guess 
the um, sea and tree changer who wants to commute to the city, every, you know, a couple of days a week? Is it going to have a range of city to Newcastle for argument's sake? Um, will it replace some actual, uh, you know, the, the more conventional regional flight um, paths, for instance? Yeah, look, that's that's where it seems to be heading. Look, I referred to, you know, urban air mobility being the catchphrase back in the Uber days, mm. and that was all about, you know, jumping around on city rooftops. And <laughs> now it's advanced advanced air mobility is the name that NASA started using that, and we we adopted that in our industry association a couple of years ago, and and that sort of covers everything. And and you know, certainly the funding that's going into it in Australia, uh, yeah, federal government's got a thirty two million dollar fund, and. They're not interested in you know uh, aircraft jumping around on city buildings. They're looking interested in regional connectivity, um, mm. and I think that's where the 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 value really is is here. Particularly if in you know, Australian cities aren't congested enough to have a, that much of an advantage going from one side of town to the other. You know you can jump on a tram or walk or or or, or, or cabot or whatever. Even even the trips from the city to the airport. It's not far enough, or it doesn't take long enough to really justify um, the added added expense. Um, unless you're going you know, from you've got a you know, a site very conveniently located, and you're going straight into a terminal, and you're, and you're saving time, then people yeah. will pay a premium for that. But other than that, it's quicker to just walk out, get in the cab, and you're there in twenty minutes or half an hour or an hour at worst case. So not in Sydney. So it's a longer range. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, well, maybe Sydney's well, well, maybe Sydney's a different, uh, uh, you know, different market, and then there, yeah, that that could work. Yeah. But, um, but look, you know, the um, yeah, Sydney Seaplanes is already doing advanced air mobility from Sydney. I mean, you know, the fact that they can land, you know, in the in the har- in the harbour there mm. and um, and fly, uh, you know, they've got um, an amphibious aircraft that can land, uh, you know, on conventional air- airfields as well. So, so they're sort of doing this, this type of service already, you know, flying into. Um, into regional uh, airports and things, um, and so it's really about um, you know, having having those those uh, you know more landing sites to to operate from and to. But I, I think the um, as far as, as far as the range goes, look, there's there's one aircraft called the Volocopter, and that's going to be doing um, a limited um, tourism service in Singapore fairly soon, I think, and they're basically going to be flying uh, a loop around the river. So it's just a tourism loop, and they're probably going to you know they're because they're purely like lots of lots of um lots of propellers uh in a configuration above the cabin it's very energy intensive to keep it in the air um <laughs> and so their, their their battery life is very short and and their their range will be very short most of the aircraft that are, are really sort of people are excited about they're they're built like they, they've got wings incorporated into their into their design so they'll have normally four propellers to lift the aircraft vertically and then they've got you know one or two propellers to push it horizontally and once it's pushing horizontally, you're basically gliding. So the aircraft makes very, the engines, the motors make very little noise, and and you you're basically a glider. So that's and that's where you know, if you go on the jo- into YouTube and, and Google Joby J O B Y, you you'll you can actually hear them flying and can, and they compare it to other aircraft. And you literally will not hear them in the sky when they're when they're gliding. So you obviously you'll see them, but you won't hear them. So 50 decibels is is um, sort of what the they're, they're, they're talking about. There will be you know, taking off and landing. There is more noise because you, you know, the, the, you're you're basically lifting you know, a, a heavy object straight up. But then once you transition into horizontal flight, they're, they're very quiet. So with those winged ones, look, they're they're um, uh, look. Everybody's. It's a bit hard to sort of cut through exactly what's what's going on, what the predictions are, because they are all all still in development. But certainly. You know, in the range of one to three hundred kilometres, I think is where you know the sweet spot where most of them are sort of looking at. Some are some are less, some are significantly more. There are others who are, some are looking at hydrogen or hybrid um, uh, forms of propulsion, which will extend the range. There's there's one called Electra Aero, which is partnering with us, and they've got a thousand kilometre range because they uh, they've got an onboard generator, so they use a a, a, a conventional fuel generator on board to charge the batteries um, uh, while it's flying. So, um, so yeah, look, there's there's lots of different things out uh, options out there, and I think it'll all sort of shake shake out eventually. But um, but we're not going to see international travel just because you know, the the weight of a, a jet fuel against batteries it's about they're about five times heavier for the same amount of energy. Um, so it's and you're not and you're not burning off the weight as you're using the the energy as you are with jet fuel, uh, so the, the plane lands mm. lighter with an electric aircraft that lands at the same weight. Um, so, but uh, but look, you know, conventional electric aircraft uh, are um, they're also um, 
you know, really taking off as well. So there's, you know, there's a, there's a couple of already operating in Australia. Pipistrel's got one, which is a two-seater fully electric trainer, uh, a conventional yeah. aircraft. Um, and there's one called the Alice, which is, um, I think it's about an eight-seater, which has just um, done its uh, test flights, which you'll find if you Google that. Um, and so, so you'll get, but they need airfields. So, you know, what, what I'm, Skyports is focusing on is, is trying to look at the property needs of this new type of aircraft, which is essentially a, a small electric helicopter. So, so Clem, do you think the tourism industry is something that, you know, should be interested in this a lot? I mean, you think about it, if you go to any city in the world, sometimes you want to explore the city, but sometimes you want to explore, you know, local, uh, you know, tourism sort of places around the city, which are, you know, a few hours drive, et cetera. I mean, if you come to Sydney, yeah. you might want to go to the Blue Mountains or you might want to go you know, up to the northern beaches or you might want to go down the south coast or something. And do you, do you think that that's going to be another real game changer for tourism is, is, you know, yes, you've got people commuting, but it's that sort of being able to get to a city and then get out of the city really easily and quickly is, yeah. you know, a bit of a game changer for tourism, I guess. I look, totally. Look, and that's like, you know, there's probably half a dozen helicopter operators around Australia who've got orders in for these aircraft already. And certainly, you know, my former clients, Microflight, have got, have got orders in. And they're, they're, you know, I think they see that helicopters, uh, the writing's on the wall for tourism for helicopters because you know, people generally don't like helicopters. Uh, they're expensive, they're noisy. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, unless you're in them, they're, you know, they're, they're, they impact negatively on everybody else. Um, so, you know, this will be game changed for tourism. But the, but the, you're quite right. I think the, the tourism use cases are going to be uh, very interesting, mainly because people will pay more for a tourism use than they will yep. for, for, for a commuter use. Mm. Just to give you an example, I started the first water taxi on the Yarra River in the early 90s, um, a little timber speedboat. And, um, <laughs> and I used to... Um, people would ring me up and say, oh, I'm in Turak, I want to lift to work. And I'd say, well, it'll be 100, it'll take me an hour to get up there, an hour to get down, uh, it'll be $200. Um, and they'd say, well, forget that, I'll get on the tram for, for $5. Um, but the same person, if they were taking their, um, uh, you know, their partner out for a romantic, um, you know, cruise on the river with a bottle of champagne, $200 is, you know, that's, that's a bargain, you know. Uh, but it's a, the same trip, you know, mm -hmm. just a different purpose. And I think, and so that's where I think, you know, we've already got a business model where yeah. you know, people are happy to pay, you know, on yeah. a special occasion, they'll, they'll pay 500 bucks to go for lunch at a winery, they'll splurge and go by helicopter, yeah. feel like a rock star for a day. Um, and, you know, and that sort of market, I think is, will be the early market where, where, you know, it will, you know, it will sustain a, a higher, because they will have, to, it'll take time for the price to come down. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And so it's the tourism uses, which will be, um, you know, uh, they'll be able to sustain it, and so you know, you're not going to—they're not going to start operating, and suddenly you're spending you know, twenty dollars to get to work. You know, it'll be—it'll um, be a, a progression. Um, it'll take some time. Early adopters will pave the way. So, will this do to helicopters? Basically, what DVDs did to uh, VHS. If you like what you're hearing here, please share this episode with others you feel would benefit. And while you're at it, why not leave us an iTunes review? Five stars, please. Every review helps make it easier for other people to find us and hear what our amazing guests have to say. We love hearing your questions and we're planning more listener Q&A episodes. Please send your questions in. You can send them via the website, which is theelephantintheroom.com.au or directly via email to questions at the elephant in the room dot com dot au. Uh, yes, yeah. Look, I mean, I, I I use that example quite a bit. I, I get <clears throat> approached by a lot of people who want to put um, software and hardware into the vertiports that we're we're building. And um, look, I've I sort of worked on the basis that um, yeah, this industry is is you know everybody's trying to find their space, and there's a lot of new stuff that's just being invented. There's people who are experts just because they say they're experts because it doesn't exist yet, and I suppose yeah. I'm one of them. I mean, nobody's <laughs> actually built vertiports yet. So, for example, air traffic control. You know, numerous people have contacted me about you know, can we partner with you? Put your system into our. In, in, I say to them, look, you know, I don't want to be the, you know, I don't want to be buying the, the beta video recorder when I should have bought the VHS and uh, end up with a very expensive electric clock. You know, so, um, uh, and it's the same with battery charging. I mean, there's there's a whole lot of people trying to become the standard for battery charging. And um, you know, is my plug going to be the, the the one the standard, or is it this plug? And but you, you'd hope that the industry will get its act together and have some standardisation. Um, but you know, the reality is they. Um, 
uh, they had this issue already with um you know i was talking to somebody who, who runs a uh, one of those private sort of jet jet bases and they have to carry you know dozens of different to- tow towing tow ball arrangements for moving aircraft around because every yeah. aircraft's got a different tow ball um <laughs> so anyway hopefully there will be some standardization but you know the problem is you know the front runners want their competitive advantage and and you know and they want to block others out of you know using their sites um so um uh, you know, it's p- pleasing to see that the, the beta, which we've I've referred to before, that's on that flight across the states, they're building um, charging stations at, at regional airports now, where they've um, they'll put their infrastructure in. People can charge their cars there for now. They'll run a cord out to the car park, uh, but then it'll be ready for electric aviation in the in the future. And um, and they're working on the basis that you know this will be a um, uh, you know, something any air, any aircraft can uh, can plug into. It's not going to be specific to their aircraft. So that's that's good because you don't want to have ten different charges. Uh, you know, mm. the investment of you know putting all the different yeah. charges it'll be huge, and um, and I think it probably works well for uh, uh, you know for the business models because um, uh, you know retailing electricity is probably going to be something that somebody gets into, and um, and you obviously want to have as many different people. You know, using your charger uh, as possible, so you can sell them more. You know, sell them all the electricity. So this. I mean, I was just joking with my brother-in-law on the weekend. He works for a, one of the big EV companies. The uh, and you know we're talking about charging. I was like, well, you know, you need to make it easy for consumers. And I'm even plugging in a charger. Just, just that mental. I've got to plug it in. You know, when wireless charging, it's just you come into your garage and it just charges overnight and you go to sleep. So oh, you want to you, know, you want to yeah. charge from the telegraph pole when you're outside. I mean, what about I've yeah. seen people with with extension cords. You know, they don't have parking in the inner city. They don't have parking. They're yeah. out in the street and they've got a they've got a heavy duty uh, yeah. cord running from their house. It's yeah. crazy. So, Clem, do, yeah. would this work literally like air traffic control though? Like. Just sort of looking out my window. Are we going to like have all the running in a like a motorway, almost the you know, and <laughs> everyone has to sort of join onto the motorway at certain points. And so it's not like you get in your EV, you know, your autonomous sort of flight vehicle, whatever you call it, and you can just go on your adventure and go wherever you want. There's sort of strict routes that you imagine where you have to sort of quickly join up mm-hmm. to a highway, and um, yeah, and then there's only certain points you can get off, and then you have to go at different heights and. Like, is it going to yeah, be look, that, that, that could, controlled? That that could be the way it develops. Look, this is something which you know I, I'm not working on, but you know I'm sort of aware of you know, what's the, the, there is work going on in this space. And I don't think that's concluded yet. And look, it may be that the um, you know, the early um, you know the safest routes are where you're not flying over people or or, or, pro- mm. or property. So if you're flying along rivers, uh, train lines, freeways, and things, that's probably going to be safer. So it may well be that. In the early days, that you, that that makes sense that you you have routes that um, for for safety purposes, but I you know I think the industry would be limited if um if you are you know bound to those routes longer term um, right you, I think it's um and also you, you get a, you get then a uh, you know, it's a bit like living next to a highway I suppose if you're living underneath a flight path <laughs> it's it's worse than having those thousands of aircraft dispersed across the skies to where they yeah, actually need call. to go so. Um, so yeah, it could be a bit of both, but um, certainly, you know, Castor and Air Services are, are working on this in Australia, and lots of other people about how, how to how to actually manage it. It's quite fascinating. It breaks my brain trying to think about it, but clearly, I'm, I don't have any of the skills or the training, <laughs> you know, to to yeah. really consider this area. But clearly, from what you're yeah. talking about, and it, it's like you say, it's a fait accompli by the sounds of it. It's just a, it's not a matter of um, if; it's a matter of when. And it's a matter of you know which of these um, these development or these these craft that are in development actually become um, you know going to production and going to you know to uh, distribution to become available. And obviously, then you're going to have different types of training because it won't be fly, it won't be driver or pilotless to start with. So it's going to be a whole new industry in in pilot training, uh, the type of pilots. Also, I think too, you know, this idea about you know the skies are going to be different to what we're used to, and you know, I'm, I'm trying to sort of I I live in Sydney underneath the flight path, so I'll quite welcome some smaller craft coming across my house rather than the planes that do currently cross, come across my my house. Um, but I guess, how do you think this might work longer term in terms of dispersing our cities, in terms of potentially changing the the 
distribution of where we live, even across the whole country? Do you, I mean, is that sort of on the table here, or do you think, well, that will just come next? Mm. Uh, look, I mean, I think it. I think it is. Um, it, it will help, but I, I, I'm not a, sort of out there saying, you know, this is going to solve traffic congestion, or it's going to be, you know, the way of you know moving, you know, tens of thousands yeah. of people around. I, I think. I think it will be very much a, a niche additional type of transport that will be a bit more expensive than um than uh than traveling in a taxi but not as expensive as a helicopter um so it might mm. be something where you know you might choose to live in kyneton and and fly to, to it's it's worth your while if you're going to a meeting uh to uh spend that extra money uh you know occasionally for the convenience of going there so i think it'll be you know a small numbers uh that that uh you know it's not never going to be mass transfer we're never going to say oh we don't we don't need we don't need roads or rail or buses or trams anymore because we've got ev tolls you know, they, they, you know there's there you know, I, I just can't see it being something where you know you're going to have you know roads in the sky essentially um I mean, you know, that said, though, you know, I suppose who would have thought before we had the, you know, the motor car that we'd have, you know, people would be happy to live on a road with cars whizzing past them and buses and, and trucks and everything else. I don't think they are um, happy. And, they just you know, end up there. <laughs> accept it. Well, you accept it, yeah. And, and, that's, and that touches on a really good point that community acceptance is going to be hugely important here. Mm. If the community doesn't want this, it won't happen. Uh, at the moment, politicians are sort of trying to work out is this, is this going to make me look good or bad? And um, mm. and you know a lot of them are sitting on the fence. Um, and I think I think it's a good news story. I think you know we're decarbonising aviation, um, and you know it's a, it's a quieter form of uh, transport. Um, but yeah, if people decide look we don't we don't want these aircraft in the sky, then you know the politicians will pull back. So this is why I think you mm. know a slow slow progression is the best way for it to happen anyway. Because and that's why it will happen. But it'll be. Um, yeah, you know, you're placing helicopters. So here's a here's a good news story. You know, the, the helicopters that used to be you know, that having that thump 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 noise. You know, you're not going to hear them anymore because uh, they're going to be electric. And then people will see them in the sky and they'll hear them and they'll say, "Well, I'm actually, you know." And they'll they realize that they can get them, they can ride on them occasionally, um, you know, uh, and have that experience. And then I think it'll be the community that says, "Well." You know, I'm happy to go to Chadston Shopping Centre and um, uh, you know Westfield Shopping Centre and 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 you know, be able to use these aircraft to get there and back. And um, uh, and you know, why do I have to go to a you know, a Vertiport, you know, like a, a mini airport or a helipad? Why can't why can't there be something closer to my house? Um, so mm -hmm. I think it'll be a progression. Look, I, the way I see it is that when they first start operating, they'll replace helicopters on their existing infrastructure. So um, and then and then it'll be from there. Uh, and this is what I'm trying to do with, with Skyports is to break the nexus between aviation and airports. So get the governments to uh, to the yeah. point where they decide, well, these are different to helicopters. We're happy to have these located in new locations and start with the low hanging fruit, which would be industrial property where you put all your smelly, loud, noxious industry. <laughs> Who's going to worry about a clean, green, you know, quiet uh, electric aviation uh, business somewhere where, you know, you put a, put a noisy factory. Um, and and then once you've broken that nexus, then I think it'll we'll see uh, you know it coming closer to more sensitive uses. So you know shopping centres and those sort of things will be the next yeah. step. And then the very last step would be you know on tops of city buildings and things because I think you know that's that's going to be you know harder from a safety perspective mm -hmm. and, and harder also from um, uh, you know for community acceptance. So it'll be a slow progression and it'll be a bit like a you know uh, a, a, a frog in a in a pot of water that's boiling. You know it, you'll it'll do. It'll it'll slowly just build up, and uh, either either you know the frog jumps out, or, or or you know it doesn't. It stops getting so hot, and everybody's just like you know happy, can have a warm bath. You know this is a great <laughs> this is a great thing place to be. Um, so um, <laughs> we'll see where it heads, but certainly certainly it is heading there. I mean, w when you say it's a fait accompli, I think it's a fait accompli that we've got the aircraft will be there, and they will they will be mm. flying, and they'll be quiet, and they'll be a revolution in aviation. But whether it's actually adopted as a as a, um, a revolution uh, in terms of um, moving people and goods, that's very much going to depend on ability to land land the, the new sites. Um, and look, that's you know, that's unknown yet. You know, there's there's strong policy support around the world from governments, but nowhere in the world has any any government said, "Here are the new rules for verti for verti ports, and we're going to allow these to go where we wouldn't allow a helicopter to go." And that's 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 where I'm trying to sort of get one of the states in Australia to to get to that point. And I think we'll see massive investment come in uh, if if we're you know if we're one of the first to do that. Um, but but just because the technology is amazing doesn't necessarily mean it's going to work. I mean, I sort of 
look back at the Segway, which is a an amazing piece of technology. I don't know if you've ever been on one, but you know, there's tourism operations mm. where you stand on these two wheeled things, and and it's just a totally natural thing where you you, you know, virtually can't fall off it, you know, and you just sort of lean to where you want to go, and off you go. And um, not the Segway, uh, I tried amazing. to ride. <laughs> Definitely oh, really? could fall off oh, that well, one. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, well, anyway, but, that, but they, they, they never took off as being, um, I think yeah. there's some places where you know, security guards mm. or shopping centres will drive them or whatever, but they, they never really took off as a form of transport uh, that people would sort of, I'm yeah. going to the shops, so I'll get on my Segway. Um, so, yeah, so, yeah we'll see. <laughs> is that because, though, the Segway is still quite close to a scooter or even a bike, right? Whereas what you're talking about here is you're saying it's going to replace helicopters. Now, I'm curious to know, A, is that your opinion or is that accepted in the indus- in the aviation industry that, that the helicopter is being superseded by this technology and it makes perfect sense? Um, because, of course, I would imagine that the, if, if it's simply that, oh, well, cleaner, greener technology, it's quieter, et cetera, et cetera, and it's going to replace something we already have and have the same use case, then I doubt there's going to be any uh, objection. But as you're saying, as it widens its use case and, and its adoption, um, then that poses challenges for regulators and for you getting the regulators to to you know regulate it, uh, appropriately or, or in a way that makes it happen, enables it to happen. But then you've got the major hurdle, I would imagine, is that um, autonomous vehicle. I would imagine that's the biggest sticking point in terms of acceptance. And mm. so I guess if you yeah, that's of, why that Yeah, if you forget yeah, that yeah, for that, the moment. Be, yeah, put that to the side for the moment because that is going to take some time. But, yeah. that's, but there's no yeah. doubt that everybody's working towards that and the aircraft will be able to achieve that. Uh, but it'll be a political decision, mm. uh, I think, uh, very much. Um, but, um, but no, look, in terms of... Um, uh, you know, helicopter operators, look, I could, you know, there's most of the helicopter operators, uh, the, the big ones around Australia, have already got pre-orders in at the moment. So, um, so yeah, look, I've got no doubt that they are seeing the writing on the wall that the helicopters yeah. are being going to be replaced. But that won't be, you know, helicopters are used for lots of things. You know, you're not going to send a um, an EV tile out to Bass Strait to, to rescue someone off a stricken yacht. Um, you know, in a storm at night, uh, you're not going to send an EV tile out to fight a fire, um, mm. you know, or to do, you know, so heavy, heavy, uh, sort of you know, lifting work and that sort of stuff. So, you know, helicopters are used for a lot of sort of heavy duty industrial uses. And mm. I don't think that anybody's expecting EV tiles at the moment to, to do that, replace that. I mean, they, they probably will eventually, but I think the, from an early use case, um, you know, most helicopter tourism routes, you're not going to, they don't do go more than about an hour because that's sort of long enough to sit in the helicopter. Um, and, you know, and that, that, out, and that, and that's the range where these are, these electric helicopters are basically aimed at. So I've got no doubt that from a, from a tourism perspective, uh, absolutely they'll be replacing them. Yeah, I mean, the autonomy thing, uh, I mean, we've got to get our heads around it with cars. I mean, I, I sort of agree what you were saying before. It feels like it's safer to be autonomous in the sky. <laughs> rather than worrying about dogs and kids and buses and signs and all these sort of things. So maybe the technology and they all sort of, you know, instead of the car becoming autonomous and then 10 years later we get comfortable with flying autonomous, it, it could be quite close to, to one another where, um, yeah, by the time we actually are letting our, the car drive us, um, it could be, you know, these things could be in the sky, you know. It's not, a, you know, yeah. a huge delay after. What, what do you yeah, need? Yeah, that's right. And with, with... Sorry. Go. So we've got a slight delay. I was just going to say, look, it. it... If, if you were if you were going to redesign a city now, you know you wouldn't design it like you know, you look at it and say, okay, well let's you know, autonomous vehicles you know, and uh, you know, ride sharing of you know nobody owning vehicles, but we've got autonomy. We can do that now if, if it's if it's everyone's autonomous, it's a whole lot safer than being some being autonomous yeah. and some not. And that's going to be the swap over in aviation as well. At the moment, if you were landing in in Melbourne on the helipad. You call into the control tower at, at um, Essendon and say, "Look, you know, I'm, I'm going to land. I give you a clearance, and then you look around, and then you and then you land." Um, so it's a pretty, you know, uh, probably hasn't changed for 50, for 50 years that the way they do it. Um, so uh, if everybody's adopted a new system, that's where it's going to be safer. It's that transition which is going to be going to be harder. What do you need? What does a building need to be suitable to become a vertiport? Yeah, look, we, we've. Um, I mean, the first thing is uh, from we, we've just looked at a, um, uh, a and designed a vertiport at Caravan Park, a, a business park in um, uh, east of Melbourne. Yeah. 
And um, so I've had aviation consultants and uh, 270 and Arab uh, engineers also working on that. And we came up with a design, a three pad design. And that's like a mini airport. Um, and uh, you know, from an aviation perspective, you need a lot of clear air. So I was actually surprised at how much clear air you needed. So that's mm. why I'm sort of less optimistic about landing on city rooftops because of the obstacles that you would need to uh, be, um, if you're going to be landing in urban environments, you need to be the tallest, the tallest building in the area because you know you need to have those sort of um, you know, flight paths in and out. Because even though they're vertical takeoff, they don't actually go straight up and down. You you you're going on an angle, um, and then you've got to have safety margins and everything else. So, um, so the first thing is you know looking at the physical space, um, and then it's looking at the um, you know what goes into into them and. Um, you know, things like fire suppression, what happens if you have a, you know, there's a fire, on, you know, a battery fire, how do you put the fire out? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, is there enough water, is there enough, uh, you know, room in the in the building rises for, for you know, uh, water pipes to come up up to, to do firefighting? Uh, what sort of navigational um, aids are going to be required, weather sensors, things like that? Um, what about, um, you know, the, the means by which the aircraft talks to the pad and, and, and has a you don't have two aircraft trying to land at the same time so there's all, all these sorts of things and look we're, what what we're doing um, our plan for next year is to actually build a um, we've done a design for a big a big vertiport but we want to do a smaller vertiport that's just a, a modular vertiport that's one air, one aircraft landing with a you know uh, area underneath where you know you've got all these bits and pieces that you need plus passenger management um, so we're doing a, a fundraise at the moment through a, a platform called Virtual, and um, uh, and so we're trying to raise about a million dollars to do the um, uh, the design and build a, and build a prototype. Um, and so your investors can invest you know, as little as five hundred dollars and be you know, own a share of the equity in, in the, the Skyports business. Um, and um, uh, so if we raise those funds, we will. You know, we've got an amazing architect who worked with um, a famous architect called Zaha Hadid. Who's now dead, but uh, they uh, he worked on the Beijing Airport, which is a you know super yeah. you know, uh, sexy design, and um, you know the the design of the I think I sent you through some images of Caribbean Park, the, the design that he's done. So we're going to do do something a smaller version of that, um, and um, so yeah, if we if we raise enough funds, we we will have a um, we'll then start looking at the the, the further details. I'll, I'm sort of uh, you know. Uh, hesitant about being going too far down the path about what goes into these things because it's the aircraft that will determine what's required and the aircraft aren't yet finalized yeah um, so you know, I've got some competitors overseas who uh, you know who are doing a similar sort of thing to what Skyports is doing and, and they're out there you know saying that they're the world's you know biggest designer and builder of vertiports and everything else and, and it's all it's all just fluff you know it's no, nobody's actually building anything yet because uh, you know, there, there's no aircraft yet. So, you know, you can build a prototype, you can test it, you can look at, you know, what what needs to work, but you can't be too um, set in what, you, what you, know, you can't just build a design and say, there it is, uh, we'll sell that for the next 20 years. So so I'm looking at, you know, with this fundraise, building a uh, this, this physical structure that's going to look amazing, um, but it, uh, what goes into it will, will change over time, I'm sure. Mm. Awesome. Clem, have you got a um, property dumbo for us? Um yeah, I do. Um, the uh, uh, about, about planning. I, I used to be a barrister specialising in planning, and um, and before yep. that, um, I was doing criminal law. And uh, so before I started doing planning, I you know we got, got married and we're looking at our first house, and I thought, well, wouldn't it be cool to live in a warehouse? And um, so we we looked at this warehouse in the, in the outer suburb of, of Melbourne, and um, looked amazing and everything else, and we almost bought it but didn't. And um, uh, I was reminded of the story because my son went to it. Was you know, twenty twenty one now. He, he's he he ended up um, at a party there. It's now turned into a brewery. So um, yeah, that's right. that's where, how it ended up. But but at the time, uh, looking back on it over the years, I thought, gee, that was sort of lucky we didn't buy that because you know, the zoning didn't actually allow you to live in it. So <laughs> you know, we would have we would have actually you know spent a whole lot of money and then you know squatted there illegally hoping the neighbors didn't complain and um so it would have been a would have been a bad uh, a bad move so i suppose what i would say is if you're looking at doing something changing the use of a property uh look at the planning schemes and get some advice as to what you can actually use it for and, and that's relevant now for what i'm doing with <laughs> vertiports is that this is a brand it's a brand new use i mean it, you know you've got heli, helipads and there's rules around helipads but I'm trying to convince governments that no, you need a new category for vertiports, which is going to be different, and uh, you're going to allow 
you know, these to be placed in places where you wouldn't allow a helipad. So, so yeah, planning schemes are, you know, good to look at when you're looking at, uh, you know, uh, buying a property or, or using it for a particular purpose. That is such a classic. Um, I thought when you started talking about a warehouse, I was, uh, I was imagining, you know, single brick walls in Melbourne trying to keep it warm in winter, but no, actually not been able to live in it because <laughs> of the zoning. And, and, and actually yeah. what was going through my mind when you were telling that story as well was thinking that, yes, well, it's like, you know, exactly that you you're going through that exact all those same motions now except we didn't buy that one back then I, you know i don't envy yeah. you i think that the work that you're trying to do to try to educate and and broaden the you know expand the mindsets i guess of all the people that you're talking to um and like you say you're trying to plan for things without knowing actually what machinery you're going to be dealing with what battery you know, plugs you're going to deal with, all, all of those things that are all the great unknowns. It, it must be like, I don't know, juggling a, a, or dealing with a bucket full of eels or something. I mean, it, it's, it <laughs> yeah. sounds like an uh, amazing challenge. Yeah, and this is why I don't have any competitors. I'm the only one mad enough to have a crack at it this early. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I'm hope, hopefully I'll be vindicated in the end that I'll have, you know, I've got a, a, a big enough head start. Look, and I think you know, three years ago, I was the crazy guy talking about, you know, flying saucers. And now the property industry and, you know, the big players in the property industry are now now wanting to talk. Uh, so, for example, mm. uh, this week I'm speaking at a, a conference on uh, logistics and freight uh, where, you know, all the big players in, in, in Australia coming together to talk about the future of, of uh, moving freight. And um, so everybody's everybody's onto it now. And, um uh, you know, it's um, yeah, still still a while away, but I think with the property industry, the lead times are so long. So if if I was wanting to build, for example, the site that we we designed at Caribbean Park, you know, it's probably going to be a you know several years to go through go through getting your planning permits, getting your finalising your design planning permit, um, you know, building and, and starting to operate. So so we really need to start now, and um, and that's where it's it's great that you know Casa has. Um, put out these timelines and um, I was on the committee um, uh, where they're helping them with the, you know, as an industry representative on developing that policy. And initially they were talking about, you know, we don't need to worry about vertiports for a while because the aircraft is still a bit away, a while away. And I said, well, no, you actually need to do that right now because the lead times for property are, are so, so long. Uh, and I was pleased to see they, you know, they listened and, and, you know, and it is actually one of the first steps that they're interested in, um, in facilitating. Clem, is there anywhere in the world that's um? I mean, I, I thought from memory, I think Dubai were doing something in this space. But um, yeah, is there anywhere in the world you can go right now and, and jump on? I know you mentioned Singapore. There, they're doing something around the city, a, a city loop on one of these sort of drone-like cars. I mean, is there is there anywhere else in the world? Well, there's nowhere where it's it's uh, any aircraft has been uh, where you can go and get an aircraft. No, so so there's no. there's lots lots of aircraft flying. You know, with test pilots in them, tests, yeah. uh, but but none of them have actually uh, started operating yet. Um, and okay. as I said, look, you know, I, I think we're probably looking, we're probably realistically looking at two years away. Um, you yeah. Know, despite you know, seeing them on, you know, seeing aircraft flying around, as I said, it's a very big step from getting one to fly to getting one to fly, knowing that you're, you know, you've got that level of safety that's required. Um, and that's that will come, but it's just going to take time. And yeah. the big hole up is that you know the, the regulators, you know, these are new types of aircraft. So if you're if you're going to design a you know a new jet to fly to uh, fly to uh, you know around the world, that would probably be easier because you've already got your mm. design standards that they need to meet. Whereas they're actually making up new ones for these aircraft. Um, so you know vertical takeoff and landing and electric propulsion, you know they're they're two very novel um, things. Even though that both have been around for a long time and we've had vertical takeoff landing aircraft for a long time and helicopters have been around since the fifties and the, uh, Osprey, uh, uh is, is mm. another example. Um, uh, but, um, uh, yeah, so it's, it, it is, it is going to take a bit of time. Um, and, uh, you know, they but they are working on those, those new rules and regulations. Clem, so thanks so much for coming on. I mean, I've no doubt that it's going to be a game changer when it does exist. I mean, we've got a client, for, uh, who moved in COVID down south coast, you know, and he flies to the to the city every week. Um, he's CEO of a company, and um, you know, gets to live where he in paradise in his in his words. Um, nice small little community, and then he flies to the city every week. And there's no reason that that couldn't happen on mass. But I guess it really comes down to: is this really going to be a thing for the rich, right? And then does that only uh, mean that only one percent of people are going to really want this, and ninety nine percent of people aren't? And then politicians aren't going to support things that you know maybe you know long-term benefits everyone so i guess it's a 
sort of a chicken and egg problem and regulation and the governments are going to have a big part to play in um, you know, whether these things actually happen. Yeah, that's that's right. Look, and it ha- and it has to, it can't be just be a you know a play thing for the rich. You know, I mean that's uh, yeah. We've seen how unpopular helicopters are, and I'm uh, I'm not sure how uh, how popular your friend is in the you know, the quiet country town he lives in, flying a helicopter every every day. Uh, but he'd certainly become more popular if he uh, you know purchased a, a, a an electric air taxi because uh, you know it'd be uh, significantly quieter. So, but yeah, it, it does have to be and uh, it does have to be accepted by a community. It has to be at, at a price point that. That more people can use them mm. if they want to. Uh, I don't think that it'll be a you know an alternative to you know, jumping on the bus or the train. I think it will always be a premium form of transport. Um, yeah. But uh, but yeah, look, you know, if the uh, I think it'll you know w- w- once it gets going, I think you know it will progress over time, and we'll we'll see uh, you know uh, you know maybe in twenty or thirty years it'll just be you know another another type of transport that everybody just accepts. Yeah. Thanks so much, Clay. Thanks so much for coming on. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Appreciate your time. Thank you. If you're looking to buy your dream home or an investment property in Sydney's inner west, eastern suburbs or North Shore, my team and I can help you buy without regrets. Reach out via my website, gooddeeds.com.au. If you're looking to buy your first home, thinking of upgrading into a new one or purchasing an investment property anywhere in Australia, my team would love to carefully guide you on this journey and most importantly, get the finance right. Reach out via our website, wealthful.com.au. Thanks for joining us. We'd love to see you again. And remember, don't be a dumbo.